Greetings, everybody showing up here. We got some people popping in as we're starting our Enviro House webinar on heating systems. Today with our panelist, Tom Baker from Mercurio's Heating and Cooling. Um, for those of you just signing in, you'll know that you are automatically muted and there's no video. That's just a policy we put in place. Um, if you do wish to engage, please feel free to click the chat button down below and you can ask questions in the chat. And you'll notice there's a little drop down that says to all panelists or all panelists and attendees. Please make it for all panelists and attendees. I'll type a little menu. Hi, welcome. <clears throat> welcome to the Enviro house. And uh, please feel free to put a message in there for me. I'll be able to uh, ask Tom any direct questions during the, during the seminar and give you guys feedback and you guys can interact and give us any information that we ask of you. Um, you can also do that in the question and answer area, the Q&A. And then what we're also going to be doing is during this, there'll be a few poll questions. And if you've been on one of our webinars before, you'll, you're familiar with these. If not, what I'll be able to do is I will put up a poll and you'll get the opportunity to choose an answer or multiple answers and tell us a little bit more about you and your experiences, as well as, you know, information that we can use to help make these a little more, uh, you know, focus them to what you're interested in learning about. Um, so right now I'm going to try a poll right now. So if everyone can please participate, I'll put it up here for a couple, uh, you know, 40 seconds or so. How did you hear about today's workshop? Was it Facebook or social media, Enviro News email list, Enviro House workshop, uh, workplace email, friend or family, maybe TPU events webpage, or anything else you can always add to the chat and we'll add that to it. Let me give you guys about 15 more seconds, make sure everybody's in on the voting. Need a few more people to participate, please. The more, you know, vote early, vote often, right? Just kidding. All right, so I'm gonna end the polling now. Let's take a look at our results. There you go. So it looks like most people heard about this uh, through a workplace email. That's interesting. Yeah. I did also, but then I worked for the city, so maybe that's what it is. So, all right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Janda, the Enviro House expertise expert, and I will um, let her take over here. Go ahead, Janda, welcome. Okay. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another one of our um, Virohouse webinars. Um, we are doing um, home heating systems, which is a good time of year to be doing that now that we have gotten chilly. Um, we will be doing next week on Tuesday, from next Tuesday at the 20th, um, from 4 to 5 p.m., we'll be doing a webinar on uh, landscape tree pruning. That one's filling up pretty quickly. Um, so if you're interested and you haven't signed up, I would suggest you do so. Um, you can go to the City of Tacoma Enviro House workshop page to do that if you don't have the Facebook link. Um, that's cityoftacoma.org forward slash workshops. Um, we also will be doing, um, I believe, one coming up the first part of November in fruit tree pruning, and I'm trying to get one or two more in before the end of the year. So this one on heating, I do want to mention, um, because um, we were, co were covering briefly all kinds of heating, the focus will be on heat pumps, um, but I did want to mention that the, the Tacoma City Council has passed a climate emergency resolution and it is directing the city to lead by example and to accelerate our municipal carbon reduction goals to be carbon neutral by 2050 and um, our community-wide goals of 80% reduction by 2050. Um, we are also doing some different things like um, expanding the tree canopy to help absorb carbon and um, keep our environment clean. Um, there are a number of other programs and there will be announcements coming up in the near future, I believe, on how the public can be involved in those activities. Um, so, um, we'll look forward to your participation in that. And now I'm going to introduce Tom Baker from Mercurios, um, who is going to lead us through a discussion on various heating systems and give you lots of information about your options. Tom? Great, thank you. Thank you. Hi everybody, thank you for being a part of this today. Uh, my goal is to give you information that will help you make uh, decisions. I'm assuming if you're on the call, you're interested because possibly you're getting ready to upgrade your system or 
or thinking about planning to upgrade in the future. So um, again, you're welcome to um, write your questions into the chat. We'll try to uh, answer those as we go. We'll give you some time at the end as well to ask questions. So once again, my name's Tom. I'm a system designer and comfort consultant for Mercurio's Heating and Air. Uh, absolutely love what I do. Uh, I believe in, uh, in the importance of our home as a place of refuge, as a place of peace, as a place where we should be comfortable and able to be healthy. And I love helping other people achieve those goals in their own homes. In addition, I love being a part of a movement that is helping um, move people towards cleaner energy, more efficient energy, which means saving you money. You can spend money elsewhere better than on inefficient uh, forms of heat. So um, again, love what I do, love sharing um, about the technology that's out there. So let's dive right in. To begin with, I want to just give, uh, for the sake of the rest of the presentation, I just want to categorize uh, heating systems into three different types. Everything we're going to talk about is going to fit into one of these three types of heat. We have zonal systems. Um, that's going to be any kind of a system where you have one heat source per room or per area in the house. Typically, you can control that separately from the other rooms in the house. Baseboard heating or in-wall um, cadet style heaters would be a good example of that. Uh, the new mini um, split duct uh, or, um, ductless systems is a, a, an example of uh, a zonal system. Then you've got your central forced air systems. This is probably the most common in our neck of the woods. These would be uh, one heat source that distributes the heat through duct work into all areas of the house. Typically it's controlled by one thermostat for the whole house. Uh, and then the last would be a combination of uh, both of the above, a mixed system. You might have a, a home where you've got, uh, originally was ducted, but you finished the basement, turned it into living space, so you put um, ductless mini split system down there or electric heat down there. Uh, so we've got zone, we've got central forced air, and we've got mixed systems. Now we're going to talk about some of the specific heat sources that make up um, any of in each of those categories. We'll start off with heating, <coughs> excuse me, we'll start off with the fuel types most commonly used to create heat. Uh, and our first three uh, are natural gas, propane, and oil. Those are all fuels that burn, create heat, and um, provide the heat for a furnace. The uh, last one would be an electric furnace. Uh, they don't burn heat, they create heat using electricity, um, or uh, in some cases they would be like your wall mounted units or your baseboard units. Um, but what's, what all of these have in common is they create heat. We're, we're using energy and we're converting that energy over into heat. So uh, we'll move to our next slide and talk about what it costs to create heat. I do have that poll question for us really quickly before we move on. Oh yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's see. So everybody, if you could please, the question is, what type of heat do you have where you live? And this is, you get multiple choice, so please don't hesitate if you have more than one thing. I know I do. So let's see. Electric furnace, gas furnace, oil furnace, electric baseboard and wall heat, traditional heat pump, ductless heat pump, not sure. Or you can answer in the chat if you're not, if you have something different. I'm gonna give you about 15 more seconds, so don't forget to vote. I'd like to thank everybody once again for showing up for this, and it's glad to we're glad to have you on this chilly Wednesday evening. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the poll in about eight more seconds. My wife keeps asking, when are we gonna turn on the heat again? And I keep saying, well, when do we want to double our heat bill is where I'm, so I'm a little curious to learn about efficiency here. All right, last chance to vote, three, two, one. Let's look at those numbers. Interesting. Very interesting, yeah. Large portion of gas furnace, all right. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you, sir. Okay, well, yeah, gas furnace is uh, most common. We're seeing a big increase uh, over the last five or eight years uh, in heat pumps. That is a category that's growing. Um, okay, very good. Well, let's talk about the cost of generating heat. 
All right, so Tacoma Power did a study, I believe this is about a year old, so it's still fairly, uh, still gonna be fairly close to accurate. But they, they, the baseline is this, what does it cost to produce a million BTUs of heat? And then they factored all of our different ways of producing heat and, and assigned a cost to that. So if we start over on the left, we're gonna go to the most expensive way to generate heat all the way to the most energy efficient. Um, the most expensive heat, and I saw there was some oil furnaces represented here on our, our uh, survey, is going to be the um, is, is oil furnaces at about fifty dollars, a little over fifty dollars per million BTUs. Uh, we can we can save a little bit by jumping down to propane. Uh, we're at about thirty eight dollars per million BTUs of heat. The next highest or the next uh, one down would be um, an electric furnace where we're a little over $30 per million BTUs. Uh, we can go to electric um, zoned heat, which gets us down to about $22. Now we're at the halfway point. The next half of the list is going to be our most efficient options. Uh, and we've got, uh, see that? Put my glasses on here. It's kind of small. Oh yeah, pellet stoves. We didn't have that in our initial slide of heat sources, but there are still a lot of people in the Northwest that use a pellet stove to generate heat. Uh, $16 per million BTUs. Natural gas, $14. An Energy Star rated heat pump, only $10 per million BTUs of heat. And then uh, right now, the most efficient heat that we can generate comes from the ductless heat pumps. We're going to talk about those today, but uh, only $8.53 per million BTUs. If you think about the significance of looking at this visually, um, go to the heat pump at $10 per million BTUs. If you've got an oil furnace, you're paying five times more money to get the exact same amount of heat as you would be paying if you had a heat pump. So that kind of puts it in perspective. It's five times more expensive to heat your house if you're using something on that far left end of the, of the scale. Um, I do have a couple of things in the chat here. Maybe you can help us. Okay, sure. Uh, one person has an electric boiler. Where might that find itself on this chart? And then uh, how does 1 million BTUs translate to what we're using? Okay, both I'm, great you questions. Okay, I think the, the boiler's probably gonna be right in between the um, zone heat, the electric heat, um, those two electric heat sources. Um, but we didn't get a number from um, Tacoma Power on that, so I don't wanna guess, but it's gonna be in that range. We're producing heat the same way, we're just heating water instead of air. Um, uh, the second question would be, if you look at, uh, if you think about your heat bill, so let's say your, your heating bill in the wintertime uh, is about $100 a month. That would be fairly typical. Um, and then look at your, uh, what kind of heat you've got. If your heat bill is 100 bucks a month and you're uh, using uh, natural gas, you're probably using, what would that be, about 8 million? Uh, no, seven, about 7 million BTUs. So it might be a... a half a week or so per million BTUs, again, depending on uh, what you're using. So they just use that because it represented a good, um, uh, a good number to work with for the math sake. But yeah, uh, you'd have to break that down by what you're using to figure out how much, how many days of heat you're getting out of a million BTUs. Um, Okay, let's move on to our next um, section here. We're gonna talk a little bit about each of those particular uh, heat sources. We'll start with natural gas. Actually, we're gonna do natural gas, propane, and oil kind of all together. They all work exactly the same way in that they, they combust gas, they, bur they burn gas, the heat heats up a heat exchanger that can be either a tube style heat exchanger or a, a shell style, it's a sealed container that um, holds the emission or the um, emissions from the combustion and it's sealed so those emissions can't get out and the fan blows air over that heat exchanger uh, that air picks up the heat and delivers it through the home via the ductwork. Um, tip so 
now we'll talk about specifics. Gas furnace typically are going to be 80 to 95% efficient. Now, what that means is if you buy a dollar's worth of gas and burn it, 80 cents worth of the heat burned is going to go into your house, and 20% of the heat burned is going to go out the flue with the exhaust or the combustion. Um, over the last 10 or 15 years, they've made really great strides uh, in nat natural gas and propane furnaces. They can get up to 95, 96, even 97 percent efficiency today with the newer gas furnaces. So again, you buy a dollar's worth of gas, you create 97 cents of heat that goes into your home and three cents that goes out the two, three, four, five cents that goes out the, uh, the flu. So here's the overview on natural gas. The operational cost is low. It's relatively efficient. The equipment cost is moderate. It's relatively um, inexpensive compared to some others. Um, the downside is that we're still dealing with fossil fuel. We have a carbon footprint um, environment on the, or impact on the environment. So not the cleanest source. If we go to uh, propane next, it, it functions the same way by combusting fuel um, and running it through a heat exchanger. We get about the same efficiency, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent typically with propane, but propane is much more expensive uh, per million BTUs like we saw on our chart. So the operation cost is very high. Equipment cost is about the same. We consider it moderate. The downside again is that we're dealing with a carbon footprint that's even higher than natural gas. If we go to oil as our fuel source, functions the same way. We can get, with our better furnaces today, we can get up to 90%, um, even with oil. The operation cost, therefore, uh, well, operation cost is going to be high. Um, in fact, it was the highest heating cost on that chart we saw earlier. The equipment cost is about the same as gas or, or propane, uh, carbon, the footprint is the uh, same problem. It, it creates uh, a negative impact on the environment. And those three are all still very common. Oil has become less common than it was 20 years ago. But if you take oil, propane, and LP, or uh, natural gas, it represents a pretty large percentage of the heat sources found in the Northwest. So let's move to something a little cleaner. Uh, we'll talk about electricity. Uh, we can create heat in different ways with electricity. Um, resistance heat is used in an electric furnace to build, uh, to heat up a coil. Uh, and the air flows over that coil into the ductwork and goes through the house. Uh, and the interesting thing about electric heat, and not many people know this, but electric heat is 100% efficient. If you buy a dollar's worth of electricity, you get a dollar's worth of heat in your house. There's no heat loss uh, that escapes the house. So from that standpoint, it's 100% efficient. The challenge with electric, electric heat is electricity is expensive. So that million BTUs is costing a lot, but there's no waste in it. Uh, so th it's better for the environment. You have a little lower um, impact on the environment. Your operational cost, however, is high. Your equipment cost is low. Typically, an electric furnace is a very simple piece of equipment, uh, costs less than a gas furnace or oil or propane furnace. Um, and it's relatively clean energy. Uh, so it represents, uh, from that standpoint, uh, a better opportunity. Unfortunately, it's expensive. Thank goodness we've got, here, before I go through this slide, um, Gator, can we do that? Uh, uh, survey. We, I'd like to. Yes. We've all heard about heat pumps. I'd like to have you guess how efficient. If electricity is 100%, what do you think a heat pump is? And you can mark your. There I go. So there's your choices. How efficient is a heat pump? 50%, 100%, 200%, 300%, or maybe you have another guess you'd like to throw into the uh, chat. Give you a few more seconds there. Jump in there. It's going back and forth. Let's see. All right, I'm gonna end this thing in 10 seconds. All right, last couple ones, come on, three. We got 80% voting, come on, you can do it. Three, two, one, all right, we'll end the poll. All right, let's take a look at those results, there you go. All right, well, the correct answer is 300%. Uh, 
it's uh, heat pumps are game changers in terms of energy efficiency. Uh, so let's talk about them for a moment. Uh, first of all, let's talk about how they work. A heat pump uses electricity to operate a compressor and a fan, but a heat pump does not create any heat. You're not spending any money or any fuel to generate heat. The way it gets heat is it captures it by absorbing it from, in, in most cases, the air from your backyard. So if you think about the amount of BTUs in your backyard, even at, let's say, a relatively cold day of 40 degrees, that there are hundreds of millions of BTUs in the, in the atmosphere to, to generate 40 degrees uh, temperature in your backyard. And this incredible invention called refrigerant, which is a fluid, has the ability to absorb that heat energy into itself. So that's where the heat comes from. It's free. Um, it's actually stealing it, in a sense, from your backyard, and it's going to take it somewhere else. Uh, that's why it's called a heat pump. It absorbs heat, and then it pumps it to a different location. Now, just for clarification, um, heat pumps, you, you can get a heat pump that uh, gets heat from the air. Some heat pumps, the geothermal, get it from the ground, where the coil lines, refrigerant lines, are buried in the ground. And in some cases, they will uh, put it in water, uh, in a body of water, to absorb the heat. There's enough heat in any of those three places to effectively run uh, or to effectively heat your home. In the Northwest, our most popular heat pumps are those that sit in your backyard and absorb it from your, uh, from your outside air. The typical efficiency, they go a lot higher than this, but typically uh, a heat pump is going to be around 300% efficient. That means when you use up a dollar's worth of electricity to run that fan and that compressor, you're getting $3 worth of heat. Uh, so that is uh, phenomenal, really. It's, uh, like I said, it was a game changer when it came on the scene and it's just kept getting better and better. So the other wonderful thing about heat pumps is the low environmental impact it has uh, on, uh, on the environment, the low impact it has on the environment. Um, its operational cost is among the lowest that you can get. The equipment cost is high. It's more expensive than um, a gas furnace, for example. Um, but again, we're dealing with some, a very clean um, form of energy. And we're watching this category grow um, uh, significantly. O over the last 20 years that I've been involved in our industry, um, it's gone from once in a while you would have somebody want a heat pump to now it's about 25 or 30 percent of our business. So um, I think on the on the survey it was 22 percent of the uh, participants in today's seminar um, have a heat pump. So Again, if you have a question about the technology, I don't want to bore you or, or um, go in too deep, but basically a heat pump absorbs heat from your backyard and it transfers it into your home. I'll, I'll tell you this, though, about it. Um, it runs in reverse during the summertime so that it's absorbing heat out of your home in the summertime and transferring it to your backyard. So it creates, uh, it's an air conditioner in the summertime by just simply running in reverse. Uh, uh, you can get an air conditioner that's not a heat pump. It's a little simpler piece of equipment, a little li less expensive, but it only does one job, and, it's, uh, and that's provide air conditioning. A heat pump is brilliant because it can keep your home comfortable year-round at um, very affordable energy costs. All right. Um, benefits, again, provides both he heating and cooling, very energy efficient, more efficient than just about any other HVA system. Um, it's proven technology. It's been around long enough that, uh, and it's a very simple mechanical device. The key to it is the refrigerant that is in those coils inside the unit. Um, there's a compressor and a fan. Those are your only two moving parts. So they tend to last a long time. The average lifespan is 18 to 20 years for a good heat pump. Um, and they're relatively low maintenance. If you keep them uh, serviced and keep the coils clean, they will run beautifully for a long time. Think about 20 years. Uh, nobody has a car for 20 years. Uh, our appliances generally don't last 20 years. So to have a piece of equipment that provides something as important as our um, home comfort that we can expect to get up to 20 years out of is pretty amazing. 
Uh, we do have a question. Okay. Uh, someone's having trouble figuring the 300%. Okay. Um, they state electric resistance was about $20 per mm BTU. That must be your heat yep. pump was about $10 per mm BTU. Wouldn't that work about twice as efficient over the resistance heating? And then are they also less likely to have repairs and mechanical problems? Like okay. Yeah, the 300% the comes from, uh, uh, it's calculated a little bit different. To, to generate heat with a heat source is different than to pump it into your house. You've got duct loss, you've got heat loss through your duct work, um, and other things that affect the, the actual efficiency. So we're, we're not really comparing apples to apples uh, when we talk about that um, 300%. And keep in mind that that 300% is a low end figure. If you go into the higher HSPF, um, which is a, a, a efficiency rating, um, you, you can get much higher than 300%. So a good question is a little confusing and technical, but, um, but that's the deal there. Now, as far as the second question, um, reliability. It's, I compare it to your car. If you take good care of your car, you change the oil, you pay attention to any noises or knocks or things that seem like you know, they shouldn't be there and you get them taken care of, um, it can last, you, know, you can go three, 400,000 miles on, on today's better cars. It's the same thing with the heat pump. If you set it in your backyard and you ignore it for 10 years, you're gonna have problems. The, the, the most common problem we have from a repair standpoint is the, the coils get dirty and clogged and it affects the ability of the system to um, operate properly and you can burn out your compressor, you can burn out your fan, uh, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. We recommend, and I'll cover this again briefly at the end, an annual maintenance where we clean the coil once a year and we check, we put our gauges on it, make sure there's no leaks and that there's no other signs of anything going wrong. Um, that should be the only maintenance you need. And I would equate it to a tune-up or an oil change um, that you're accustomed to doing on your car. All right, let's keep moving here. So heat pumps can either be put into a traditional central forced air system where you're relying on duct work to deliver the heat into the house, um, in which case you get whole house comfort. Um, the heat pump sits outside, it's connected by the refrigerant lines to a furnace or an air handler, which blows air over the warm or the cool coil and delivers it through the whole house. But recently there's been a newer technology emerge and it's called ductless heat pumps, or you may have referred, heard it referred to as um, ductless mini split heat pumps. And these skip the whole duct work thing and just deliver the energy straight into the house. So uh, you can see in the picture here, a good example of how it works. You've got your heat pump outside absorbing the heat. The refrigerant lines deliver that hot vapor to the coil inside. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's the cassette that sits up on the wall. And a fan in the cassette blows the air over the coil in the cassette directly into the room. So there's no duct loss in the heat pump. Uh, there's no duct loss um, in the ductless heat pumps like there would be in a standard heat pump. So you're getting um, even better efficiency out of it. The, um, the downside of it is you, if you were going to try to heat your whole home or cool your whole home with it, you'd need a cassette in each room or in each living space. So there are specific applications where this works really well. Not always the best solution for a whole home um, system. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. The most common system in the Northwest with a ductless heat pump is, is a single head system where you have one outdoor unit and one indoor unit. The indoor unit will typically go in the main living area of the house. So say you have a 1600 square foot home, you've got a kitchen, a dining room, and a living room that are all pretty open. Combined square footage on that maybe is six or 700 square feet. You can put one head inside located um, to cover that 600 square feet and get perfect comfort in those three rooms, that open area. Uh, and 
since that's where you live most of the day, that's where most of the heat or the cooling is needed, it actually provides a tremendous amount of energy savings, even if you're still using your other heat source for your other rooms. So a single head system is uh, super quiet. It is super energy efficient, and it can be a real um, creative way to reduce your heating bills, or it's also a great way to solve heating problems. You know, with this whole pandemic season that we've been in and with all the people working from home, uh, one of the things that we've experienced as a company is we've got a lot of people who set up a home office upstairs in a bonus room or a master bedroom and had no idea how uncomfortable their home is in the summertime upstairs. Uh, so we had a lot of uh, people where we were able to put a single head, a small single head system in their home office, hook it up to a small outside heat pump and make that room perfectly comfortable even in the hottest days of the summer. Uh, we'll be able to do the same thing in the winter for them too. But that's a single head system. Um, you can get more in, uh, creative than that. You can put multiple heads on one outdoor heat pump. Um, you can put up to five different pieces of equipment on one heat pump with today's um, equipment. And we're not limited just to the, that um, wall mounted head that I showed you. Um, you can see those here if you can see my mouse moving. Um, but you could also use a floor standing unit. A lot of people that have large windows or don't want things on their walls uh, will go with um, an indoor unit that's just a floor standing unit. Um, you could also, if your home can handle it, if you've got the right structure, you can put the, the units up in the ceiling so they're flush mounted to the ceiling uh, where they're discreet, uh, but they can still deliver the heating and the cooling from that vantage point. Or uh, over here, uh, you've got what's called a mini cassette that can go in the attic and you can hook um, short ducted runs to it to deliver heat to smaller rooms. Say for example, you have a, a hallway and you've got three bedrooms off the hallway. You could put one of these small units, they're about the size of a large suitcase, mounted up in the attic. You can run three duct runs, one to each of your bedrooms, and that one unit will provide heating and cooling for those three, for those three rooms. So you could have that for the bedrooms. You could have maybe a floor standing unit down in the bonus room in the basement, and you could have uh, a wall unit in your main living area. Um, and that would be a three head system. Um, that's what we would call that. So again, very creative, a great way to address problem areas in the home or to just reduce your energy costs. Tom, I have a couple of questions right on this subject. Which okay, is great. We'll stop then. Uh, sure. The first one is, we are an older retired couple with a 1600 square foot house. Gas furnace is 11 years old, AC is 25 years old. When AC fails, would it be cost effective to replace both of those at the same time, I'm assuming, with a heat pump? Uh, you can answer that one first, and I'll give you the next question next. Okay, um, absolutely. The, uh, and this is a good segue into something I haven't mentioned yet, but should. Uh, with the heat pump, you have two options. You need, you need an indoor unit with a fan to run the heat pump. And most, in most cases, that would be an electric air handler or an electric furnace, which is called an air handler. It has a coil built into it. But in the Northwest, it's also very popular to use a gas furnace to run the air handling capabilities. So you could, you could replace your gas furnace with another gas furnace and then replace your air conditioning unit with a heat pump, and you'd get the benefit of energy savings through our six or seven month uh, winter heating system. And it would, uh, in the long run, it would pay off uh, in energy savings very well. And if you've gotten over 20 years out of your air conditioner, you're an example of somebody who probably took care of it, maintenanced it, and uh, enjoyed the reliability of those systems. Great. Uh, second question uh, from another uh, person. Okay. Do more heads reduce the amount of heat? So if you have like one unit that has these three in the different bedrooms, is it going to reduce the heat? You know, like when you turn on the vent in the car, suddenly the one over on this side gets lower. Like, so is yes, that great question. Uh, fabulous question. So the more ports, that's what we call them, the more ports that the outdoor unit has on it. Let's say you've got three ports. Um, the 
the ports are have dedicated a certain amount of BTUs based on the size of the room that you're say a bedroom, uh, one of the heads is going to go in a bedroom, it, it reserves 7,000 BTUs for that bedroom. Okay. If you've got another um, unit or head going into a, a larger living space that needs 12,000 BTUs, it reserves essentially uh, that much energy for that. If you get into a situation where you're, uh, let's say we get into a really cold day, these mini split systems can heat your house down to somewhere most of them can get down to the low teens. That, that's how efficient they are. But let's say we get down into one of those really cold weeks and you've got three heads. There is an internal uh, control device that will, let's say you're not using the bedroom reserved heat of 7,000 and the big room is having trouble, it can go borrow heat from them. So they're very, I won't say complex, but very sophisticated. Um, and the big important um, priority here is to size the system properly for your house. So when we go into a home, we do a room by room heat loss calculation. And everywhere we're going to put one of these heads, we determine exactly what is going to be needed on the coldest days of the winter and the hottest days of the summer. We use a uh, government sets design degrees based on our temperature um, dynamics in the Northwest of 47 degrees for our average winter day and 17 degrees for uh, the low end uh, of winter. Uh, so if we do our job right and we put the right equipment in, the answer to your question is no, uh, there's not going to be any diluting of the power between the three heads. Uh, again, good question. Was there any other Gator? I know we're good. Thank you. Okay, well, let's keep moving. Now, one thing I do like to mention to people that are considering a heat pump, whether you're thinking about the mini split or the traditional central air um, style heat pump, is that they're a different kind of heat than what you're used to, particularly if you're accustomed to a gas furnace or an oil furnace. Number one, they will, they'll deliver heat out of your heat registers at a lower temperature. A gas furnace on average will deliver 120 degree air out your register. Um, a heat pump, it, its average is closer to 105. So when we got our first heat pump, my wife had a hard time understanding it because she was used to grabbing her coffee on a cold morning, finding her favorite heat register, standing over it, and letting that warm air blow on her. When we got the heat pump, she was convinced something was wrong because she didn't feel that warm heat um, hitting her legs. So there's a 20 possibly a 20 plus degree temperature differential in the heat coming out of the register. That means it's going to take longer for a heat pump to get your house up to the design temperature. Let's say it's 70 degrees in the winter time. It'll take longer to get it there um, because it's, it's doing it with air that's not quite as warm. But that's part of the efficiency of the heat pump. We're actually taking the heat out of 40 degree outside temperature and we're, we're producing 100 degree air or 105 degree air for your house and we're getting your house up to 70 degrees. So you have to make that adjustment in the way you use the system. Number one, um, you don't want to set back. We don't recommend, manufacturers don't recommend set, setting the temperature back at night like we used to with the gas furnace. We always would turn the furnace off during the night, turn it back on in the morning and let it heat the house up in 15 minutes. You can't do that with a heat pump. It's more energy efficient to maybe set it back three or four degrees, five degrees at the most, um, and then program it to come back up to um, your preferred temperature by whatever time in the morning you get up. Um, remember, the heat is free. So even though it's counterintuitive to <laughs> let the thing run all night, the heat is free. So uh, it will take longer and your home will be more comfortable if you make that adjustment. That gives me a, I have one question on the, on the board and also one personally, like, okay. so I guess it, their question is, can mini splits work with smart thermostats or do they have their own similar functionality, which is kind of similar to mine is like, you program it to turn off when you go to work, you know, or whatever, and then turn it on when it, you know, in the morning, is there a, is there a, a timer set on these things? Or is it just, like you said, just running and it does its own efficiency running, I guess. 
Okay, first part of the question, um, the difference between a, a thermostat for a mini split and a traditional system is the mini split system has a lot more control over how the system runs because the technology in the heat pump outside is called an inverter. It's an inverter compressor, which means it's infinitely variable in terms of the output. Uh, let's say that we put a, a 36,000 BTU unit outside. In a traditional heat pump, every time it comes on, it's going to be delivering 36,000 BTUs into your home. Whether it's 50 degrees outside or 20 degrees outside, it comes on at full speed. In the mini split systems where they have this inverter technology, the thermostat learns the dynamics of your house. It takes three pieces of information. What temperature is it outside? What temperature is it inside right now? And what temperature do you want it to be? It keeps track of how long the system takes to, to raise your house X amount of degrees based on the outdoor temperature. So there's an infinite variety of circumstances that you're gonna encounter based on what you want and what's outside. So they're far more sophisticated control centers or thermostats um, in the mini split systems, which is another reason that they're so um, energy efficient. They both give you really great programming options. You can tell it what temperature you want it to be at what time of day or morning or night. Um, you can run them from your smartphone. You can run them from the Bahamas if you're on vacation. Uh, some of these smart stats uh, can tie into other features in your home like your door locks and your light bulbs. So really once you start getting into designing the system, you've got all kinds of options to play with. Uh, so I hope that answered the question. I think the, the main question I think that someone else was a smart thermostat can do they, you know, we can do everything on our phone these days. So is there that same kind of connection at, you know, yes. functionality? Yep. Okay. Yeah, you d you download an app. Okay. I think you have to do with the the smart ones anyway, but um, yes, you you have a lot of programming options that you can do from from your phone or from a remote location. Okay. Um, one other thing I'll mention too. Uh, well, I'm going to mention two other things. One is uh, heat pumps um, on occasion will begin to ice up the coil. Again, you've got 20 degree refrigerant inside a copper tube. So there are certain circumstances where humidity plus temperature and other things uh, may cause ice to begin developing. So the heat pumps all have a defrost mode. When that starts happening, it will kick off and revert to a defrost mode, defrost the coils, and then come back on and, be, and continue heating your house. They make a different noise when they're in defrost mode. We get a lot of phone calls saying, something's wrong with my heat pump. It's making a funny noise. Uh, and in most cases, that's because it's in defrost. So that's something that you never experience with a furnace. So that's another thing to get used to. Um, and then the last thing is it's, it's important on your furnace to replace your filter every three months. It's critical on a heat pump system to um, replace the filter in the air handler or your furnace. When that gets clogged and the, the fan can't push enough air across the indoor coil, uh, it can cause all kinds of problems. So we emphasize that when we install, um, we can set, we set people up if they want us to on automatic shifts for, um, for filters so that they don't forget. Uh, but that is really important. It's, it's kind of like having uh, uh, an expensive car. You've got to take care of it. You can't neglect it um, and expect it to continue running great. All right. <clears throat> um, already covered some of the technology um, improvements The I mentioned the inverter compressor in the uh, mini split units. They have something similar that's available in the standard heat pumps, uh, variable speed compressors, and they offer some really great options for homes that have challenging um, layouts, like uh, upstairs that's really hard to cool or a downstairs basement that's really hard to heat. A variable speed compressor can be manipulated to to help the um, to help even out the temperature throughout the home. So that's something to ask about if you have a contractor come out and, and talk to you about equipment. Um, let's keep moving here. <clears throat> Maintenance I mentioned is really critical. We we and all manufacturers recommend an annual um, tune-up clean uh, coil cleaning. Uh, we 
we charge $159 for that. It's uh, well worth the investment to keep your system running perfect. That's how you get 20 years out of it. Oh, one other thing I'm going to mention here too. I'm going to go back to this slide. Um, there's a lot of great brands out there uh, and there's a lot of great contractors in our marketplace. You need, I would say the most important your decision you're going to make is the contractor that puts this in for you. The way it's set up, the way it's installed, the way we adhere to the uh, recommendations of the manufacturer for for all kinds of things like static pressure in the ductwork and um, clearances to things like bushes or fences. Um, all of that matters in order for the, for the heat pump in particular to run well. You want to go with a reputable contractor who really knows what they're doing when it comes to heat pump. I'll, I'll say, say this tongue in cheek, anybody can put a furnace in and the furnace is pretty forgiving. It'll, it'll work just fine even under the worst of situations. That's not the case with the heat pump. It's got to be done right. Um, so you want to check out who you have install it. Uh, and then the second part of that is when a, when, when a contractor comes to your home, um, it's critical that they do a heat loss. We, we belong to, uh, or we use an accredited heat loss calculation um, program or software that the whole industry has agreed is the most accurate. Um, it's, it's called ACA, but what it does is it gives you the peace of mind that if we come in and we collect all the data on your house, square footage, ceiling height, uh, windows, whether they're upgraded, low E, insulation values in your walls, your ceiling, your attic, it's really a process. We're going to spend probably 45 minutes in your home gathering information, making sure that we understand what the needs of this home are going to be in both heating and cooling, and then we size the equipment properly. Uh, that's critical. If we oversize it, and we have to, we have to fight with people who think bigger is better all the time. They, if we say they need a three-ton heat pump, they want a four-ton heat pump, right? Uh, but oversizing is the worst mistake you can make with heat pumps. An oversized heat pump um, won't last. It'll cycle on and off way too frequently and wear itself out. It doesn't dehumidify properly in the summertime, and it can overheat easily in the wintertime. So, um, ask the contractor about uh, the heat loss calculation. We will give you a copy of it. If you ask us, we'll send you the results of your heat loss so you can see that we've um, designed it to industry approved standards. Um, and that's why we're able to stand behind uh, our installations as well. So those are two things uh, with the contractor. Make sure they've got a lot of experience with uh, heat pump technology. Make sure that they come in your home and spend some time and do a heat loss calculation. All right, I mentioned there's a lot of great brands out there. We, uh, Mercurios Heating and Air, are an American standard and Daikin exclusive dealer. Um, Daikin is our exclusive brand for the mini split systems, the ductless systems. Daikin is the original inventor of the mini split technology. They were out of Japan where that technology was first developed. They've been in business the longest and they're the largest um, mini split company in the world as far as manufacturing goes. Uh, American Standard for our standard heat pumps, uh, American Standard and Train. Actually, American Standard bought Train many, many years ago, and for the last 15 or 20 years, um, they're identical right down to the part numbers, uh, just in different cabinets. So for some of you car guys out there, it's kind of like a, a Chevy and a GMC truck. It's the same truck in a different body. Uh, that's Train and American Standard. We're proud to represent both of those brands. They're top tier brands in the industry. Uh, we're proud that we've been around 27 years serving the Tacoma community. We'd love to have an opportunity to be of service to you. Uh, you can find our information online or go to the Tacoma Power uh, or Puget Sound Energy websites. We're approved contractors with both of them. Uh, and we'd love to help you out in any way that we can. Don't uh, miss the opportunity to cash in on the rebate programs that utility companies are offering. Um, everybody wins when we move towards cleaner energy. Everybody wins when we move towards energy efficient equipment. Uh, for example, Tacoma Power will give a rebate up to, a, uh, let's see, up to $1,000 for a central heat pump system. 
Um, you've got to meet the requirements for the energy efficiency on that system, but they'll give $1,000. So you've got to ask yourself, why would they do that? Uh, what's in it for them? Uh, that's a lot of money, $1,000. Uh, I just talked to somebody from Tacoma Power yesterday, and they were telling me that only 30 to 40% of their uh, of the electricity that they sell to the Tacoma marketplace comes from the Tacoma marketplace. It comes from their sources for creating electricity. They have to go to third party vendors to produce electricity, the other 70 to 60 to 70 percent, and that electricity is much more expensive. So, as as we're growing, they are seeking ways to make better use of the electricity we have available. And if you think about the difference between uh, baseboard heat and a heat pump, uh, if we can reduce our electricity in heating mode by 50, 60, 70 percent, Tacoma Power wins, we win. Um, so they're encouraging us to do that with rebates, both on the ductless heat pumps and on the central uh, heat pump systems. Puget Sound Energy has programs as well. You have to be an uh, electric company, electric customer of, P of PSE if you, uh, in order to qualify for those. Um, but they also have uh, gas furnace rebates too for the high efficiency furnaces. So do your homework, um, talk to your contractor. They know, we know all of the um, rebate programs available through your utility companies. And we do have a question about the rebate program, the yeah. poll question. Can I throw it up there right now? Yeah. And then while everyone's voting, I do have a couple questions. Uh, I think you're getting close to the end, right? So yep. uh, one question was to have multiple heads uh, or ports, um, you must have duct, do you have to have duct work, duct work already? Um, this person's home is all baseboard heating right now. So is that one thing? No, uh, you do not have to have any duct work. So uh, the example I used where we would put uh, some duct work just for the bedrooms, we would put that into your attic, assuming that you have an attic or a crawl space where we can make that work. Um, but again, they're shorter runs, they're closer to the actual unit from which the heat is being dispensed, and it's a much simpler system or, or process than building a whole house duct system. So that's just one option uh, that you can add to your mini split system. Now in that case, is the, is the unit in the ceiling, I mean in the, or just the, the ports? Like is the, is the heat still outside to get that circulation, right? Yes. So. Okay. The way it looks, let's say you have three different um, pieces in the house, a, 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 a ducted cassette in the ceiling for the bedrooms and two heads. You're gonna have three refrigerant lines coming out of your outdoor unit. And those three lines, each one will go to one piece of equipment in the house. So those three ports will feed three different pieces of equipment. One of those or two of those could be ducted um, ones, all of them could be ducted. I mean, it's really a versatile system. Excellent. Um, I do have one more, uh, one other question. This okay. one's a, little, a very, um, well, this is a specific kind of, um, the idea of integrating a heat pump with a gas furnace is confusing. Okay. Uh, I had a contractor suggest this as well. If the heat pump is capable of heating my home independently, isn't the gas furnace unnecessary equipment and expense at this point? So. Okay. Fantastic question. I really should have addressed that when I went through that because uh, that that would leave uh, a question just as you've asked. So there is a point at which the heat pump is no longer efficient. There's a temperature uh, at which it can't really do the job of keeping your house warm. We call that the, the set point and it can be anywhere depending on your system from 30 degrees to 18 degrees or maybe even lower. Uh, so it's, it's important to have a backup heat system or backup heat source, even though we only get a few days a year or maybe even every couple years where we might drop below the, the worst case scenario, you need to be able to keep your house warm. So even in a traditional heat pump system where you have an air handler inside and the heat pump outside, it's all run electric, you've got heat strips inside that furnace that only would be used for backup heat when the temperature drops below the point that the heat pump can uh, satisfactorily handle your needs in the house. When we put a gas furnace in place, the gas furnace acts as the backup heat. 
You may only need to use it a few times a year, but when you need it, you need it. What we don't do is put in systems where there's absolutely no backup heat uh, because that would leave you in uh, not a good situation uh, when we do get those super cold um, days of every couple of winters. And what's that point again where the, the heat pump is no longer efficient? What's that called? It's called the set point. And set. Uh, yeah, SET, and we, we figure that out. It's a mathematical calculation that we do based on the um, heat loss calculation in your house and the efficiency of the heat pump. And <clears throat> there are different theories or philosophies, I should probably say, about where that heat pump should be. And each system works a little different. Sometimes the backup heat works alongside the heat pump and both can produce heat together, uh, which is a little more energy efficient. Uh, in some cases, um, it'll, the heat pump will just um, be programmed to shut off and it'll turn it over to the gas furnace or to the electric heat. So uh, <clears throat> the, it, it can be a little bit complex, but the, the simple point is there is backup heat for every heat pump install that we do. And that can either be a gas furnace or an electric handler, air handler. Excellent, thank you. Yes. Any other questions? I got my heat source right here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> my big gray cat. <laughs> yeah. How, how many people live in your home? How many people can she heat up? Uh, he, he's good for one, and uh, usually it's <laughs> yeah, you're just your feet, so not, not much. <laughs> like a single head ductless system. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, my time's up. I thank you for yours. Uh, unless there's any other questions. Uh, we have one more. I have baseboards, so would they have to stay and be my backup? I also have baseboards and they're always okay. in the way, so. <laughs> uh, yes, maybe not all of them, but we would look at your home and we would recommend keeping one or two um, for that backup heat if that was the case. Excellent. Uh, any other questions on the chat from anybody? I noticed that none of the participants today, the attendees have participated in the Tacoma Power rebate program now that you're aware of it. I mean, that's some incredible rebate there. So let's see. Um, yeah, definitely go to the TPU website and uh, get more information about that. Yeah, and I didn't mention it, but the, you have a choice uh, with Tacoma Power, you have a choice of either a rebate or a zero interest loan. Mm. If you do the math, in most cases, that zero interest loan is a better deal. Uh, so check both of those out. Uh, it's a pretty simple application process, and they're really doing everything in their power to make it easy for you to get an energy, uh, clean energy energy efficient system for your home. Great. Uh, we have just a few more minutes and one more question here. How do you get heat for your home when the temps are 40 degrees outside with a heat pump? <laughs> I think that right, fear kicks in, right? That it's 40 degrees. Here's how I answer that question. Um, if you remember from science class, there is a temperature called absolute zero. Absolute zero is, I can't remember what it is, 140 degrees below zero, I think. Absolute zero is when there's no BTUs at all floating around in the atmosphere. And that's 140 degrees below zero, I believe. So, uh, you know, I was in Sweden one winter and got to experience 20 below zero, and it was unbelievably cold. But even at 20 below zero, you know, there's a whole bunch of heat keeping us from getting to absolute zero. So you just got to think about this uh, refrigerant being able to absorb those BTUs, don't think about the temperature, think about all of the BTUs it's taking to bring us from absolute zero. You know, if there's no sun, we're at absolute zero. If there's sun, we could be at 40 degrees, which means there's plenty of energy in the air to steal. Okay. I think it's, if you're on the Kelvin scale, it's like minus 270 something, absolute zero. But yeah, that's- is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's been on the Kelvin, but that's Celsius, and that's, yeah, so. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've been in science class. <laughs> and I didn't, I, get, that, I didn't yeah. get that good a grade anyway. <laughs> right, I wouldn't pass high school anymore, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, me either. <laughs> um, well, excellent. Well, we do want to thank you. I'm going to um, get Janda back online here, and thank you for your time. We do appreciate you joining us, Tom, and everybody. All your questions were very helpful and great. Answered some questions for me as well, so. Um, thank you, Tom. Jan, you can you. take over here. Thank you. And I want, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to thank Tom also. Um, 
He did a great job and answered a lot of questions. And I've heard this presentation probably, not Tom's, but I've heard a presentation probably 20 times over the last few years, maybe, <clears throat> maybe more than that. We've done like three or four a year when we've been at the Envera House. And each one I learned something new. So it, it is, um, the heat pump system is an amazing thing to look at. And if I was at the Enviro House, I would invite you to come in and see the one there. Um, unfortunately, I can't do that right now. But um, if you're interested, do follow up and um, check it out. Um, or as I said before, our next webinar is um, pruning landscape trees, and that will be next Tuesday on the 20th from 4 to 5. Um, we will be also doing a pruning fruit tree one early November. You can go to cityoftacoma.org forward slash workshops and um, find the registration information there. All so, right. Thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. If you could sign out, I'm going to start kicking everybody out. We're going to have a little post meeting here, but uh, Tom, stick around. Jana, stick around. Thank you, everybody. Uh, go ahead and sign out now. Thank you. See you next time.